Okay, power wasn't on. Hey, if it doesn't work, plug it in. We good? I'll get started because i got a lot to roll through. Uh, most of you know me. Those who don't, um, I'm Jeff Kruth, WA3ZKR. I'm the chief staff electrical engineer at the Space Science Center at Moorhead State University, and my day job has kept me so busy I haven't had time to do any ham fun. And so when you come time to write a paper, you think about, well, what, could, what, would, what am I doing that people might be potentially interested in or might have some use for ham radio? And it turns out that there's a few things I've been involved in in the past year that might have a little bit of application to ham radio. So today I'm going to talk about six things really quick. If anybody wants to interrupt me, feel free, because I do it to everybody else, so you certainly have uh, largesse to do that with me. I'm going to talk a little bit about some waveguide plumbing issues and problems we had and how we're solving it, and some custom band reject filters we had to end up making, how to clean some waveguide with hydrochloric acid. Those of you who watch the microwave reflector might have observed a little discussion on that a while back. And then Terry came up with a very interesting dish I tested for him, and I just want to show it to you in case you see any laying around in junkyards. And then, of course, a little bit of update on my uh, attempt at how to do microwave noise source calibration without using noise figure meters. And then the last one is one that's near and dear to my heart. Where the hell is everything these days? In your yard. No, it's, it's, not, it's not true. You know, I'm running off of old stuff. I haven't really gotten a lot of new stuff over the years, and I was one of these kind of people where when I saw it, had a chance to get it, I got it. And it was a good thing I did because I just don't see things anymore. They, they're just not coming around like they did. So anyway, to tell you a little bit about what's going on at the day job, those, those of you who don't know, is uh, I, I assume everybody pretty much knows what the DSN is, the Deep Space Network. It's the three stations around the world by which all space probe data come back to the Earth. Like you watch pictures on the evening news of Saturn or Jupiter, well, that's coming down through the DSN. So that's run by Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, for NASA. And like I say, three sites, one at Goldstone, Fort Irwin, out in the Mojave Desert of California, not too far from Pasadena, where JPL is, one in Madrid, Spain, and one in Canberra, Australia. Well, now there's a fourth one. The first ever external organization to join the DSN is Moorhead State University. Uh, we were invited by them to become a deep space station. We have an assigned number. We're DSS-17, Deep Space Station 17, and they actually show us on the map. However, they don't call us part of the DSN. They corrected us and said we are an associate station. I guess because NASA is a little prickly on what belongs to them and what doesn't. And Yeah, well... <laughs> But it's nice because we're in Kentucky, and, and uh, for example, we had a big day in May when they, they launched the Marco, or pardon me, Marco and the uh, InSight satellite to go to Mars. So the big InSight satellite's going to Mars, and it's going to put a lander on Mars and do some things. And so along with it, they had two CubeSats, 6U CubeSats, fly out to Mars. They're actually going to fly past Mars. But along the way, what they're going to do is act as relay stations for the InSight lander. And uh, so when they launched this in May, on May 5th, they brought us online as one of the DSN stations, and it was our very first real operation, and we got data exactly at the same time as Goldstone and exactly in the same quality and quantity as Goldstone, so we were very pleased by that. Of course, it wasn't that far, but, you know, I'm getting some of my best DX now that I've ever had with some of these jobs. So our frequencies are not exactly hand band, but you know they're getting up to X band and they're above 5.7. Our transmit is around 7.2 and our receive is 8.45 plus or minus 50. And our transmit power is uh, around two kilowatts. Now we have a 3kW tube and a 5kW supply and we're only gonna run at about 2kW because we really wanna make that thing last. It was 100 Gs. This is what it looks like, real pretty from uh, CPI Varian, and it only took a couple years to get them to pay attention to us. I guess 100 grand doesn't go as far as it used to because I was on the phone to these people all the time trying to get them to come up with the proposal for us to do the job, but they finally sent it. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, of course, you know, LCD screen, and you can control everything over the internet. It takes like zero dBm drive to drive it all the way up. Built in everything. And uh, the power supply, I can pick up. The tube, I couldn't pick up easily by myself. And the tube inside the power amplifier assembly 
gets a little weighty. So that was kind of interesting. Modern power supply technology has really taken us a long ways. So here we see the uh, KPA with its shroud removed, and that's just all big heat radiator there. And here's the Kleistron power amplifier in its place with the, uh, the shrouds on it. Uh, the Kleistron was shipped to us in a big steel box. So that was a whole pallet by itself, and then the amplifier assembly, then the power supply. And hey, well, you know, you get something for 100 Gs, right? Uh, what's cool is, of course, the Kleistron power amplifier has mechanical tuning to tune the cavities to different frequencies. Well, this is all digitally controlled now. They've got an electromechanical tuner on there, so you just tell it where you want to go in frequency, and you're right there. And so they have a bunch of different tubes that will do different frequencies. They selected one for us, and we got the thing programmed for our channels. It turns out the Kleistron has 45 megahertz bandwidth. Our transmit band is 90 megahertz wide. And so if it would have just been, you know, double that, we wouldn't have needed a tuner, but hey, here we are. So off we go. Another look at it, some really nice waveguide in here. They've got everything. Here's where the KPA hooks up. And of course, lots of monitoring stuff and harmonic filters and stuff in there for going out. And uh, over here, a little solid state driver amp so you don't have to put much power into it to drive the tube. So kind of interesting. Here's another look at the air plenum stuff for the KPA, and I don't know, maybe you guys see this stuff every day. I certainly haven't, so I thought you might have some interest in seeing. Eh, that's the kind of number. So it's 10 kW of prime power input to the KPA, and you're getting a 3 kW out, say, and so you got 7 kW waste heat you have to get rid of. And for those of you who have visited Moorhead and seen our big dish and the lower equipment room for it, you know it's little conical shaped room where we've got a bunch of our stuff. Well, we thought we'd originally put the amplifier in there. Well, guess what? You don't want to dump that kind of heat in there. So now you have to cut holes in walls and up your AC uh, capabilities and all this other stuff. So that was a big drag. So one of my biggest jobs as the uh, DSN upgrade manager was figuring out where to put this beast so that it would work efficiently. And, you know, you don't want to stick it outside in the rain, but it looked like that might be what I'd have to do because, you know, if it gets rotted up out in the rain, why it's big money to replace it. The waste heat issue, which I've spoken about. And, you know, the high dollar per watt. You know, we're looking at uh, 3KW or 2KW for 100 grand. Okay, break it down. You know, that's pretty expensive dollars per watt. And I would need, therefore, my transmission line to be as short as possible so that I'm not wasting that power that I'm generating, getting it up to the feed for transmission. So if I started from the lower equipment room, I've got 185 feet of something to get me up there. And then think about it, I have to go around the azimuth wrap of the dish. As the dish rotates, the transmission line would either have to have rotary joints in it, which, oh, by the way, that wasn't possible through the azimuth bearing, or it would have to be something that could be put around the azimuth wrap that expanded and contracted, and oh boy, who wants to do all that? So then you start thinking about the candidate transmission line systems. Well, rigid waveguide is too lossy. Coax, of course, is out of the question. And so you're thinking about elliptical waveguide. So now when you go to the Andrews catalog, what do they say you need to use in that frequency band? Well, EW77 or maybe 63. And further considerations of all this, all things considered, said maybe we want to put this thing outside up on the azimuth deck that's right above the azimuth turntable. So we only have one degree of freedom to worry about, and I can put a rotary joint on the elevation knuckle. That's not a big deal. And now I can minimize my waveguide run down to about 80 feet. Yeah. Yes. Is that <laughs> no, it's going to actually what I'm doing is uh, I have some military transport cases that I had in my backyard accumulated over the years, and I'm packing the KPA into those, and then I'm going to build a shelter around them, and I'm going to use the waste heat per the recommendation of CPI as part of the dehydration system. Okay, so you take and you recycle some of the output stack into the input to dry the air coming in. And we've been, I've been struggling with all this stuff and figuring out what to do. And I've got an electrically controlled damper. And now I've become an HVAC technician, figuring out how to hook up all this six-inch uh, stack stuff and all. But anyhow, yeah, no, I don't have an... Well, it will be on, we will have heaters in there to keep it relatively dry in the boxes. So there will be non-condensing 
Uh, you know, even if it's humid there in Kentucky, which it is like basically year round, we'll try to avoid any condensation. And then of course, once you fire up the thing, you're going to dry it out pretty quick. But yeah, I'm really concerned about the rotting aspect. But when you take all other things, if one guy suggested I get a plastic outhouse, <laughs> right? Because they're all, oh, that's weatherproof, dude. They're all fiberglass. You can put it right up there. I say, yeah. Nobody wants to look up at the back of the dish and see an outhouse sitting up there. <laughs> no, that's out of the question. So we're working on other solutions. So now, <laughs> yeah, but, but, some things just don't wash, Mike. I can only go so far. What do you mean one picture of it? Yeah, right. What'd you say, Mike? Power so, moonshine. Yeah, there you are. Power of moonshine still. Well, somebody might get excited about that. I think we're an alcohol-free campus. So now you start looking at what size of a waveguide could you potentially use. And this, this enters into a typical discussion that hams have about waveguide. What am I going to use for waveguide? What have I got? Well, I got this, I got that, I could butt these things together, I could do this, all this other stuff. So, of course, Andrew says, well, for that frequency, you should use EWS-77, the smallest size waveguide. Hmm. Or you could use EWS-63, the next size waveguide down. So when you look up the commensurate losses of these things, EWS-77, of course, has the highest loss per unit length. 63 has a little less. And it turns out, let's, for example, let's consider something like uh, WR-90, 8 to 12 gigahertz. If I run it at 8 gigahertz, of course, the cutoff is about 6.5 gigahertz for WR-90. If I'm running it at 8 gigahertz, I measure X loss per unit length. And if I look at 12 gigahertz, it's a lot less. Why is that? It's the opposite of coax, right? Because coax loss increases as a square root of frequency, but not so for waveguide. Waveguide loss decreases, of course, and I see him going like this, meaning if I get out of band, it goes back up. But at the top end of the dominant mode, it's less loss than at the bottom end of the dominant mode. And the reason for that is because there are literally less bounces in the waveguide. The waveguide... The, as was demonstrated early, the TE10 mode is basically flying right down the center of the guide. It's no longer hitting the walls. The closer you get to the low end cutoff, the more bounces you have. So the more ohmic losses you have in the guide and the greater the loss gets. So it actually makes sense to use the biggest size guide you could possibly tolerate for the lowest loss. And Mike sitting there is looking at using WR52 are you using or what do you... It's EW52, and you want to use it at 10 gig, which if you could get away with it, that'll be great, because this loss will be like next to nothing. Well, so I go looking for elliptical waveguide, right? And all of a sudden, there isn't much to be found. So I used to work in the tower business with people doing tower tests, and I call all my old buddies up. And nobody's got any elliptical waveguide. So what, what the, I mean, usually they've got some scraps, some pieces, 100 foot of this, 70 foot of that, left over from big jobs. I said, well, well, where is all this stuff? He said, oh, when copper went up a few years ago when the Chinese were building their big stadium over there, we scrapped everything. I said, well, how about fittings? You got any, you know, EW fittings for any of this stuff? You got any fittings for 77 or 60? No, we took all the brass scrap in too. So everybody I called, it was gone. It was like, oh my God. So a call goes out over the microwave reflector and I got an answer for a fellow. And if you read my paper in a book, or if you look at it later, uh, my waveguide was delivered to me with along with 7,000 frozen rats right to Moorhead, Kentucky. It's kind of an interesting story. I finally found some, but it was EW52. And I say, well, 52 is not supposed to work at this frequency of 7.2. Let's try it out. So I had a chunk in the lab that had, you know, connectors on both ends. Uh, what is it, DE2, 252s, 252 DETs. So I put adapters on it, hooked them up to the network analyzer, and lo and behold, it worked. And it had a lot less loss than what was predicted for the 63 or the 77. So I said, you know, this might be a good thing. I can get more of my KPA power delivered right to the feed by using this big, bigger waveguide size. So uh, 52, the last choice, became the choice of, of the system. So there's the dish for those of you who haven't seen it. And where I'm going to be putting this is... Right up in here is the platform. See, the azimuth bearing is here, and then you climb up to this other guy, and there's uh, some space up there. So that's the azimuth platform above the bearing. So that's where we're going to be sitting with this. And then, of course, the waveguide has to sneak around, go around the elevation axle, come across the back of the dish, come up one of the feed support arms, and go to the feed. 
So I end up with, like I say, about 80 feet or so, a little bit of slop. I explain where the numbers come from. Unfortunately, we had our feed canister design done by a guy from Comsat Corp who has his own company. He builds excellent feeds, by the way, really great stuff. But he put 112 in it, so I have uh, WR112 flange sitting out there. And now, out of the back of my KPA, I told Varian, I said, well, or CPI, well, we're going to use 112 size guide, you know, EW77. I, so I want a 112 flange. They go, sure, we'll do that. Uh, but it's going to be WR137. I said, what? They said, oh, yeah, well, you know, you want 112, that's fine. Yeah. You can go buy an adapter. We're going to give you WR137. So I have CPR137 coming out of the back of it. Along the way, I go looking for a rotary joint. Now, I need a high power rotary joint to handle three, four, five kW. Uh, where are you going to find that? Well, I found one on eBay. And when I, I inquired of the guy, he said, it's brand new, you know, guaranteed. I said, oh, you know, you want 800 bucks or whatever it is? I asked him, you know, negotiate a little. All of a sudden, that wave guy joint disappeared off eBay. It came back on a, by another vendor, $2,500. <laughs> so I said, you know, this was one time I shouldn't have tried negotiating. It did not work to my benefit. Uh, got the secretary to talk him down to 1500 So it cost me twice what it would have. If I just bought the damn thing the first time. So there's, I think there's a lesson in there, maybe. But anyhow, so now we have this rotary joint, but it's in 137. So now i got to come out of 137, go to 159, go up to WR50 or EW52, uh, come back out of 159, go down to 137, 137, back up, and then go all the way up to the dish, come down from 159 to 137 to 112. At its very best. And you know what's fascinating about that? The guys at JPL are amazed at what we're able to do and the price we're able to do it for. They really are fascinated by the stuff that we can whip up there because we're using ham radio mentality for this stuff. It doesn't need to be gold-plated. It just has to work. And so you've, you've heard the long and windy explanation here. The best way to do this, of course, would be like what Brian Justin showed you, nice long tapers. They always work. In fact, that's part of the thing I teach in my microwave class. I say one of the rules of microwaves is anything works if done gradually enough. Unfortunately, I can't get all these tapers, and if I order them, they're expensive, and they're going to take months to get. And so what do you do now? Well, you make something. That's, that's the ham radio initiative again. So we made them. We took quarter, I designed quarter wave plates, and I said I want to go from 159 guide to 137. And if I use a quarter wave plate, reflections cancel, right? Because a reflection here and a reflection here, are half wave out of phase by the time the reflection's done, they cancel out. And I have the freedom to pick whatever size I want. So I created my own waveguide size for this. Oops, wrong button. WR148, which is halfway between. And we machine some aluminum adapters, and here's the two different flanges. Here's the 159 flange, and here's the 137 flange. And you can see the different gasket sizes. And we put this together, and we measured it in the lab. And I mean, the loss was almost not measurable. I'm saying less than a half of a tenth, but it was very, very good. I was very pleased with it. The student machinists made this. And so then uh, I ordered some brass, and they sawed it up, and they may be a brass one because you don't want to put aluminum out in the weather against brass flanges. Not a good idea. And off we go. So we solved that problem. So now we can get from 159 to 137. And it may turn out that I have some 137 EW connectors coming someday from someone who may help me in this and may eliminate a pair of these. But if, if for some reason that shouldn't happen, why, I have a fallback position. <laughs> no, no, no names. <laughs> Next problem I had, transmit leakage into the LNA. Oh, my God. You get to looking at this thing and you say, I spent $100,000 for a cryogenic LNA. I don't want to do anything bad to it. I've got a 2KW amplifier, and I have a situation where there are times which I am going to be transmitting and receiving at the same time. I'm going to be going out at 7.2 and coming back at 8.45 because I'm going to be doing precision ranging. One of the interesting things about the DSN is they can range a spacecraft's distance from the Earth to within centimeters. 
And the, reason, the way that they're able to do this is they already know basically where the spacecraft is to within a half a light second, plus or minus. So they're within plus or minus 90,000 miles. And then they use a long PN sequence, so they use a tone sequence, and they're able to send this out and let it go through the delay of the entire system and bring it back, measure that delay, and figure out where it is. What are some of the requirements of that? One, you must know the delay of your own system precisely. So that's one of the things we're working on. Number two, you have to have an extremely accurate frequency standard. We now have a hydrogen measure, which Dr. Ackerman has uh, agreed to help me prove out to make sure that our maser is actually doing what we think it is. And number three, you can't have any variables in your system that change, like, oh, your coax. Okay, if you look at Teflon coax and you look at 20 degrees centigrade, there's a knee there in the phase stability of it. And on a warm day, it's a little hotter than 20 C and then it cools down later in the day and the phase length of the coax changes. So all of your ranging data is wrong. And so I've been looking at phase stable coax systems and other things, other ways to implement this to try to eliminate all the systemic variables so that we can calibrate this system properly. But anyway, to get back to what my problem is, my problem is this transmission isolation. And I looked at the, oh, doggone, I keep doing that. I looked at the uh, isolation of our diplexer. It's 110 dB. You'd say, wow, that's really good. No, not when you're starting at plus 63 dBm. And it turns out the LNA is only supposed to work from 8.4 to 8.5. But what do you guys know about the bandwidth of low noise LNAs? <laughs> yeah, they're this big. Why? Because if you put a filter in front, you got loss and it kills the noise figure. So naturally, you've got you know, broadband LNAs. Well, it turns out the Dagon Cryo LNA has just about as much gain at 7.2 gig as it does at 8.4. 63 down to 62. So I know that I'm going to have transmitter leakage problems and it's going to saturate my LNA, which is very bad because once you saturate it or even come close to any sort of point up the compression curve, your noise figure goes to crap, your gain goes to crap, and uh, I won't be able to hear what's going out there, on out there from that spacecraft for ranging. So I really have to get rid of this problem. And you'd have thought we'd have thought of this earlier. In fact, you'd have thought that the JPL engineers, in fact, the guy who was the chief ar architect of the DSN, is one of the guys that comes and visits me every couple months. His name's Tim Famine. He's a great guy. We had a lot of fun. But somehow, in all these discussions of what we were doing, this thing didn't come up. And then one day, I'm measuring stuff in the lab, and I start thinking, and I say, oh, I, I think I have a problem. Yeah, I have a problem. What am I going to do? Everything's already built. This very complicated, dual polar, dual circularly polarized waveguide structure at two frequencies is already built with all this stuff in this big canister, uh, $250,000 worth of fabrication and installation. And what am I going to do? And, you know, if I, if I have uh, my leakage signal and my gain, uh, this is what's coming out of the LNA, and that's, that's up past the 1 dB compression point of the LNA, so I know I'm going to be saturated. So I got to add something. So I go looking around in the feed structure and I find a slot where the guy put in a section of straight guide before the LNA, after the diplexer, 5.6 inches long. I say, okay, I got something I can pull out so I could put something in, but whatever I do can't be any bigger than 5.6 inches. So that said it. So here's a look at what the LNA looks like in the canister. There's $100,000. Here's the cryo LNA, and here's the Sterling Cycle Compressor. 10-year guaranteed lifetime. Pretty impressive stuff. And then you can see you know, a baseball switch and some waveguide, cross-guide coupler and some waveguide things, pressurization for the system. 17 Kelvin noise temperature on this thing, and it's real. I took it up, and we measured it on the roof. Uh, that 10-year guaranteed lifetime is amazing. Over at Green Bank, West Virginia, one of their biggest expenses is helium compressor maintenance. They spend on the order, and I'm, the number may have changed, but I was told years back for the entire site, $100,000 a month in helium maintenance. And that's compressors. and Because, you know, you don't own helium. You just borrow it for a while, and then it goes away, and you have to get more. And, so it, and it ain't cheap, and it's becoming more expensive as time goes on. Are they running or Dude, I don't know. You know, but they got big ones, so, yeah. The, but anyway, uh, what do I do? So I say, well, hey, you know, I, 
I did the quarter wave plate thing. How about if I make a waveguide beyond cutoff filter? So, okay, that's a good way, and that's something hams can use. And so that's why I'm talking about it today. In fact, uh, Al Ward came up and did some 77 gig experiments back 2013, and he stuck a piece of WR8 into his WR10 system to cut off some receiver noise and other things. And so I'm thinking, hey, I could maybe use a waveguide beyond cutoff filter. And so I had a piece of WR75 on the bench. I measured that, and guess what? Not good enough. Uh, too much ripple in the pass band of my receive channel. You know, it cut off real nice at 7.2, but it didn't look so good at 8.4. WR90, well, that's too big. I know that's going to, it's 6.5 cut off. I know that's going to let the transmitter through. So obviously custom. So I get into this and I say, well, let's try an intermediate size. And I just picked the size off the top of my head. Let's do WR80. So we made a WR80 quarter wave plate and we measured it and it wasn't good enough. And so we got about maybe 10 dB rejection. I said, well, you know, that wasn't a very long piece of filter, was it? And I'm evanescent mode and so on. I can get some leakage past it. Let's make it longer. Let's go to whole 5.6 inches. So I made a piece of split block waveguide and lots of screws, and they're spaced, of course, less than an eighth of a wavelength apart so that there won't be leakage from them. And I bolted this thing together, and we measured it, and it worked pretty good. But, and as you see here, a real nice loss up here in the, in the band I wanted. The visoire wasn't even too bad. Uh, but the rejection was not stellar here in the band that I wanted to reject. Here's the filter laying here and all. So, okay, more is needed. Let's, uh, let's play around with it and go to a smaller size. Now, this is what's interesting. WR80 wasn't good enough. WR75 wasn't good enough. Right in between, WR77. Only 30 thousandths difference in width. This is amazing. And my, my technician, Jake, my student technician, had a nice plot for me, and I forgot to get it integrated into my talk, but he had a plot that had the comparison of the two, so I apologize, it's not here. But yeah, I got pretty good loss now here uh, on this guy, uh, but let's, let's go to this other size guy. Whoa, look, the loss is down here now. Uh, but I got some bumps up here in my insertion loss, and oh, this is a 20 dB scale for Visoir. My Visoir is not that good here now. Let's see what's going on. What can I do? Well, the last line, tuning screws. So a triple stub tuner will get you out of a lot of problems. So a three screw tuner and waveguide is a great way to go to match things. I did a talk on uh, matching a 24 gig dish, and I, I ended up using one to do that. It worked fine. But the trouble is that's a single frequency solution. And I need about 100 megahertz of bandwidth and maybe I could get by with it. So we first did three screws and it wasn't quite good enough. So I said, well, if three was good, maybe nine would be better. <laughs> so I put two or three sets of triple stub tuners in there. One at the input, one in the middle, one at the output of my 5.6 uh, length waveguide. And guess what? I got my loss back, I got my visoire back, and I pretty much got the rejection I want, except the first time Jake tuned it up, he had a spike here. And so I said to Jake, good, not good enough. Keep tuning. Well, he likes tuning filters. In fact, he says to me, you ain't tuning, you ain't filters to tune? So he went back and he tweaked and tweaked and tweaked, and he did better. And so, yeah, we're here, and ah, the visoire is not looking as good as I want, so we kept going. And eventually, we got down to where we liked that, we liked that, we liked that, and so we got it. And so we have a device now that we believe will give us the additional 60 dB that we require to knock the transmitter out of the receiver LNA. And here we see it being machined in solid copper, and I was hoping to bring that with me to show you guys. Uh, but the machinist broke a drill bit off in it, and so he's been etching it out with alum. I warned him. I said, copper's crappy to machine, but he didn't listen. He's in a hurry, broke a drill bit, and so uh, that, that didn't get here in time. But you know what's interesting? A fellow was talking about his buddy, I guess it was Skip. His buddy gave him a four by eight sheet of copper. Yeah, I bought a block of copper this big. It's $250 to machine these filters out of. I can get two, two filters out of it, four halves. And uh, copper ain't cheap. This, of course, this was tellurium copper, uh, oxygen-free high conductivity. It's supposed to be the easiest machined and the, and the best for filters. But after we're done with it, we're going to get it silver-plated, 
I'm going to send the brass screws. We're going to use that, get them silver plated and all the nuts and everything. Because, hey, you know, when you're fooling around, every little tiny bit in this world counts. I mean, that's like, can you talk to something at Mars? Can you go a little further? And so this case, it really, things do make a difference. All right. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll pick it up. Wow. Time goes fast. We're having fun. <laughs> Cleaning brass and copper waveguide. Hydrochloric acid is your friend. Got a lot of argument about this, but believe me, a little simple chemistry and a little care and don't burn yourself. Cut the stuff in half, put it in a plastic bucket, <laughs> dip the parts in, agitate them, clean them. They come out wonderful. So here's a before and after. There's what a waveguide fitting looks before you clean it. There's after. Uh, dramatic difference, okay? And you know, when you think about skin depth and losses, you want to get all the crud off the inside, works really well. Uh, people were worried that it might degrade the insertion loss. It doesn't. Here we are with uh, befores and afters kind of thing. So all right, works. <coughs> On to the next thing. The Ericsson 10 gig dish. So I already alluded to Terry giving me one of these dishes to test for him. It had this weird looking WS75, WR75 flange milled into the back of the dish. This is very common where they just plunge an end mill and they move it across and so you have this oval shaped hole and it looks like it won't work, okay? It looks weird, it doesn't look like what we're used to, but it works fine. So here's the dish, very deep dish, uh, Cassegrain design, got one of those little champagne stem things there with the plated back. And uh, here's the WR75 fitting hole, see how that looks weird? Took this thing, put it on the network analyzer, and it must have been a ham working at that company because the dip was, well, here's 10.4, here's 10.35, here's 10.368. That's a 28 dB return loss. That's pretty good for that dish. So you really couldn't ask for any better for something out of the junkyard. Of course, here's a view of the old scalar analyzer system that Bob likes. So we lashed it up into the chamber and we cut a pattern with it. And of course, N3QED did this for us. And uh, there's the pattern for the thing. And it's interesting, we have a piece of software that calculates efficiency. Uh, we got 58% efficiency on this. The beam width of 3.5 degrees, a gain of 33.9 dB, and a nice clean pattern. You really couldn't ask for it. So my recommendation, you see one of these Ericsson dishes, buy it, or save it from the aluminum scrap, they're useful. All right, moving on. Calibrating noise sources. I'll whip through this. It always gets a lot of argument, but I had a specific need. I need a very hot noise source for my receive band at 8.45 gigahertz. And I have a few noise sources to pick from. This wasn't all of them. And I, like These are a lot of these uh, system type noise sources down at the bottom. Uh, some of them are marked and some of them aren't, and some of them are marked for one band but can be used in another. So I wanted to check them out. So how do you do this? We all know how to use a, a, a noise figure, a pan feed to do it, but when you go above that, you need to have converters, obviously. And every time you have converters, you add in all of the issues with mixing and filtering and blah de blah And I like to make a system that's very simple. So the system that I've come to use is one from the satellite world called a hot, cold gain plate for measuring G over T. And we actually use this on the roof. Here we're up on the roof. Here's the cryogenic amplifier with a horn pointing up. We've got a baseball switch and a load on there and a thermometer. So we're looking at the sky. We're looking at the uh, hot load. And we're doing a Y-factor calculation. And I'm actually able to measure the temperature of the sky. And it was 8 Kelvin. It's not bad. And that's at 8.45 gigahertz. And that's using what they said the projected number for Moorhead is 8, 8 to 10 degrees Kelvin year-round, depending on, you know, time of year and all. And, of course, that was using the uh, actual registered number of noise temperature for the particular LNA. And right there, it was about 17 Kelvin. So, okay, I know the system works. So, but you got to have a good source. So I got a bunch of sources, but my buddy Bob, he's got a really good source with a K connector on it. And I said, no, I'm going to use that. Very, very flat, 15 ENR. And of course, that's my old concept for doing it from back in 2013. And I kind of started there. But I actually implemented the YIG filter and I threw a 2 to 18 amp in here. And so this is a technique of measurement that is comparative. I don't really care about much of what's happening in all of this. I'm going to compare two things, ceteroparabus, all other things being the same, I'm comparing A against B. 
So I'm comparing my noise source, my really good one, against my unknown one, and I'm looking for the difference between them. So, you know, here was the original concept that I played with, and now here's the one that I've got going. And, uh, you know, using this guy or even more modern variants of him, you can take a lot of readings and numerically integrate them, average them, and smooth everything out. I just did it by eyeball. Okay, you're in a hurry, you want to heat sink an amplifier real quick, here you go. Because these things get hot, and then I measure the thermal noise of the load there. Yeah, I got plenty of gain in my system. And then I move on and I measure the really good noise source and I get a number for him. Now that's all I care about. I just care about that number. So I turned this guy on, I turned him off, I turned the amplifier on and off, I waited time, I remeasured, re-zeroed, remeasured, and I got that number consistently, 51.68. So, okay, I've got a repeatable number. Now I put something on there I don't know. And I measure another number. And so I know what the ENR of my original test source was, my original standard, so I'm able to go back. Damn it, what am I doing here? I'm able to go back and calculate, based on this new number, that the noise source here had an ENR of 37.78. All the noise sources that are made are about 35 dB ENR. So when they make those noise diodes, those avalanche diodes that come out of MSC, not anymore, Noisecom or whoever's doing them now, they're all at about that level. So when you get a 15 dB ENR source or a 5.2 ENR source, that has an attenuator built into it. And that attenuator is a good thing because it, it helps improve the VSWR, the noise source. Uh, these things are the unpackaged raw guys. And they sometimes will have different noise levels if you vary the DC bias. Now, most of you would never dream of taking your noise source and varying the DC bias. And in fact, your instrumentation noise sources often have regulators in them to prevent variation based on the power supply. But I found from taking this down from 28 volts to 15 volts, I gained about 5 dB more uh, of excess noise ratio because I want as hot a source as I can get, because I'm injecting it through a coupler via attenuators and other things, and so I needed it to be pretty hot. Anyhow, <clears throat> so running through there, I figure one of these days I could take all this junk and everything and build it right into this guy and then control that with a DAC and make a computer automated system, so stand by, and maybe you'll hear about it in another five years. There's the last one, real quick one. Where's all the surplus gone? You know, we've always benefited from the stuff we could find. Of course, with the way things are going, we might not need to worry. With Steve building these multiband transverters and all these great chips coming out and everything, we might not need to go dig into surplus for very much longer. But it was one of the things that helped leverage everybody up, and it's the way we get test equipment and other things. Well, you need a thriving manufacturing economy if you want surplus in your country. And you know, the defense contractors were once a good source, and even the smaller mom and pops, I like to call them companies, less than 500 people that would often get new equipment and get rid of old stuff. But a lot of those things have gone away, and the big companies now are using asset management recovery teams to uh, milk the most out of their stuff. So I've noticed, ex except for things that are involved in cell sites or base stations, there's really kind of been a Big decline. When was the last time you saw a guy show up at a ham fest with a box of brand new Type N relays? Yeah, that's what I thought. So, and even people like Keysight, they change their methods by which they support repair and their life cycle stuff. Once they were released from the Cold War agreements they had with Uncle Sam, they no longer had to support things like they did. And they could go to a six year or five year support cycle for something. And there were, I've seen products that look new. They're out of support. They were made for five years, 10 years ago, and they're no longer in support. And it's like, wow. And there's no information available on stuff. It's like, holy cow. And of course, newer, harder to fix, less flexible software-driven stuff, the costs are higher. So, old, and so, you know, new stuff isn't even available. And when it is, sometimes it's not desirable because it's harder to make work. Like finding documentation for an 8510E. You know, you just don't do it. It's not around. Old gear is vanishing. Why? Well, older, older pieces have no value to surplus dealers, but they're still on the books. A guy remembers when he sold that thing for 1000 bucks, and he don't want to sell it to you for 50 bucks. It's just a philosophical thing with them. They'd rather let it sit there. The surplus dealers are getting old. 
They're dying off. They're selling out. They're retiring. Okay. Kentronics, BEC, Candell, Tucker, Test Lab, Electronic Research Lab, Vigar, Radio Research, even Fair Radio. I know Phil, and he's not doing a lot of business. His son's not interested in taking over the company. So what's going to happen when Phil decides he wants to play tennis more than sell stuff? And I like to say I lived in a golden time, and so did most of us. We really did. We were there. I li we were at the party when the booze ran out. There was lots of stuff, and you were able to get it. But the new guys on eBay, how many of you see this? Uh, untested lights up for parts repair. Yeah, yeah, that's what you said. Nobody wants to sell you anything and guarantee it working because they don't even know what it is. All they know is they're at an auction. They pull out their you know, iPhone. They go in here and see what this kind of thing sells for on eBay. Oh, look at that. That thing's worth, boy, you could get a lot of money for these. And they bid it and they buy it and they take it and put it on eBay. They don't know anything about it. And so I call them the one and dones. They're the people to go to auctions and buy stuff and put things up, and then you don't hear much about them. They're not the regulars, all right? Old gear is valuable for precious metal and other recovery, even the copper in it, the aluminum. I know one surplus dealer who has now become a scrapper. He went out and bought one of these huge metal shredders, and he took all his, his dad was a big dealer. He took all his dad's stuff and shredded it. He took all his older stuff and shredded it. Then he went out and he bought a lot of these people out and shredded all their gear. It's gone. And so it's, it's gone. It's disappearing. So now when you look at the prices on there, I was looking for 8410 stuff. There are ridiculous prices for old 8410 analyzers on there, and they have no idea if it works. What the hell? Why is that? There was a time when you could walk through a hand fest, you saw some 8410, what do you want for that? 25 bucks, you know? But those days are gone, and this is why. So I just wanted to comment on this because I see a lot on different reflectors on the internet of what people talking about. Like I watch the HP reflector. Guys are always talking about stuff being destroyed. A piece of older HP gear from the 1980s is worth more for rental recovery than it is to you guys. So they're going to take it and they're going to scrap it out. It's gone. Uh, 3586 selective level meters. I've watched guys buy those just to pull the gold cards and the frequency standard out of and throw the rest in the shredder. And the gold cards go into gold recovery. The uh, 10811 gets sold or the 10544 gets sold and then the rest of it is ground up. There ain't no spare, spare parts for that one anymore from that one. It's gone. So it won't be in anybody's estate sale after a while. They'll be gone to make new ones like my old man used to say. In fact, people have talked to me about coming down. You, those of you who have seen my junk pile, people have said to me, am I done? Yeah, and I have a question actually for okay. you about this. Okay, well, let me la get the last word out. People, I've been approached by people, and, you know, hey, you want to do this? We'll come down, we'll haul all your gear away, we'll send you the assay and pay you for what it was worth. All right. I'm done. Any questions? John. Okay. Yeah, just, just a question and a comment. Um, I have been trying to sell some stuff uh, recently. I bought a new toy that was expensive, so some old toys have to go away. And I found eBay has gotten weird. Um, I put up you know, known working equipment. I could not even get a bid on a 2-gig signal generator where the starting price is $49. It's weird. And, and also, um, I looked what one of the equipment companies to uh, get a bid for them to buy off a 3848 system and oh was, they don't want that yeah it was just nil you know, so you have to know what you're doing to use something like that and you know the modern generation of people they just want to push a button and get an answer they don't have to think about how to do it yeah, but just a really strange ebay has just gotten really weird in the last couple of years for stuff that you would think would sell and nobody does any other questions sir Jeff, one thing that I've run into is the so-called scrap yards that we used to go into to get surplus equipment. Weren't they great? They're still there, but OSHA has limited access to employees only. I used well, to buy a lot of surplus cell site equipment and test equipment that showed up back in their electronic section. But uh, now they have a police officer standing there making sure no one goes past a certain line. Oh, man. That's when you get to know the owner and you go in on Sunday when the police officer's watching football. Holy smokes. Yeah. Um, 
one of the <clears throat> you know, eBay, in my opinion, they they don't know what they're selling and they, they ask too much for it. Um, well, that's a common that's a common thought. Yeah. Uh, my question is, is uh, you know, kind of the early 1990s is the end of the golden age because you cannot get uh, component level service documentation. Clips. Uh, do you have any thoughts about you know, service documentation past that? Is there any? No, you're out of luck because they decided that I actually, I actually got burned on a signal generator. I bought this beautiful signal generator up at the news group ham fest one year and uh, a guy wanted to buy it off me and I should have sold it to him because I took the thing home and used it. It was the pride of my workbench and a month later I turned it on and it came up with error 01, no RF output. And so I said, oh my God, this thing blew up. What happened? And it got, my tech and I, we got into it. We analyzed it, you know, and I tried to get documentation for it. It was an 80, ah, uh, shit, it'll come to me. It doesn't matter, 8645 or something like that. One of these synthesized things. Anyway, <clears throat> you could not get component level documentation. It was down to the module. And we looked and looked and looked. And we finally said, it's somewhere in this. I thought I did something to it. No. The module it was in was buried down in the instrument, not close to any input output port, so I couldn't have blown it up, you know, like putting power back into it or something. It just died. And so I sent it back to HP. And I called them up first and I said, you fix it? Oh yeah, $4,000 flat rate. <laughs> and because it was for my business, I said, well, okay. And so we carted it over and they, and they said, oh, $4,000 flat rate provided it's not the YIG and something else. Okay, so we sent it to them and it came back. It turned out a gallium arsenide prescaler chip, which was a custom HP part, had just decided it was tired and didn't want to play anymore. And they put another one in and the thing worked again. And I learned something. I don't buy the latest and best equipment anymore because I can't maintain it. And so that's, you're going to see nice new toys that do really cool things. And you can go ahead and buy them, but when they quit, you're done. Buy another one. Because it's not to HP, Agilent, Keysight's benefit to have you fix it. Because then you won't buy new ones. That day of guaranteed support's gone. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Oh, and my last one. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff.